that was uh, Kurt Johnson, um, quite a scholarly guy, uh, Phil, uh, from being a monk to a PhD, working at the Museum of Natural History, uh, kind of a Renaissance type guy in the spiritual world. Yeah, he's, he's uh, had quite an interesting life uh, and a lot of surprises. I remember him telling me at one point uh, that during his science, his science days, his uh, his area of focus was butterflies, right? And and he wrote a book about um, Vladimir Nabokov, the author of Lolita, who many people don't realize was a a, a, a scientist at Harvard who was really somehow some had some responsibility for or some achievement in discovering a new species of butterfly or something. He was fascinating in his books about that. Uh, tidbits of information you would never know if you didn't listen to us. By the yes. way. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, he, um, uh, he he was a close associate of Wayne Teasdale. What do you know about Brother Wayne Teasdale? Well, I uh, one of my regrets is never having met him in person. Uh, I was at the Parliament of World Religions in 2004, which Kurt mentioned, and was looking forward to meeting him there. But I remember there was an announcement, because he was a, a, a major force behind the parliament, there was an announcement that he was uh, too sick to come. And, and he died either during or shortly after that, as I recall. So I never met him in person, but I did speak to him on the phone, and I was very honored that he endorsed one of my books uh, in, in the past and gave it a nice... Uh, uh, complimentary um, phrase, but he he was um, he called himself uh, an urban monk. In fact, I think his memoir was called Urban Monk, um, and chose to live a monastic life, but in the world. I believe that world was Chicago, at least at one point, and was also deeply involved with other spiritual traditions other than his own mm -hmm. Christianity. And that was what his book, The Mystic Heart, focused on, that uh, wisdom that you find at the sort of uh, the, the mystical traditions of every religion that have so much in common and come to discover the same things. And for people who are interested in that, that's what we call the perennial philosophy, and they should listen to our interview with Dana Sawyer about right, that. Right, um, right. But, and so he wrote the book, The Mystic Heart, and he was creating, a, he had the vision of creating a new monastic order that would be interspiritual and engaged in the world. And he was, you know, an activist but then got very sick and died. And Kurt is one of those people who are trying to carry out his vision. Right. You know, it's interesting, uh, Kurt today talked about uh, the evolution of uh, religions and moving toward non-duality, uh, uh, where there are, are many more similarities and differences from religion to religion. But it, it, if you look at any religion, you have folks like that that seem to transcend the particular their religion they're in and, and move toward more universal principles. But then there are, in every religion, there seems to be those fundamentalist folks who uh, look at everything, you know, in terms of the, the literal uh, uh, translation of their scripture or whatever, and uh, want to say very separate uh, from everyone else and either want to just keep separate or they want everybody to become them. And uh, we're seeing that play out now in the world, but I think it's been playing out for thousands of years. That's and, right. And, we, yeah, I mean, exactly I think the question right. is, if to, if we get to a point where, uh, and I thought we would have been to that point by now, but it doesn't seem like we're anywhere near it, where the uh, universal principles uh, overwhelm uh, the principles of difference and people see the similarities. I mean, obviously there's a big interfaith movement that that is focused on that and all, but it seems that there are, every major religion has those fundamentalists that uh, would like to keep everything quite separate and uh, not not look for the similarities, but really focus on their uniqueness. And, and it goes beyond just focusing on differences. It, it goes to the core of how pe what people identify with. And you know, at the lower levels of development, where the the identification with your tribe 
is fierce and um, anything that threatens it is um, to be destroyed or combated at least, uh, then you run into, you know, all kinds of of trouble. I mean, it would be one thing if everybody said, no, I prefer to keep things separate. I'm in my own little silo, and our way is the right way, but left everybody else alone. It would, right. be, it would be very <laughs> different. But, you know, and I think, you know, we're far more advanced as a species than we were in the past when, you know, tribes were killing each other. Uh, routinely, and you know, now with all the interaction we have in these pluralistic cultures that we live in, and the internet and all that, I think just the interaction among people tends to elevate the level of awareness and the level of development about these things. But we, there's still a long way to go, and and that's you know one of the things that is seldom talked about in the media and all that is the these different developmental lines within each religion. They speak about them as if they were monolithic. Right. Muslims believe this, Christians believe that, Jews do this. But, you know, within every one are, you know, vast <laughs> diversity of people who represent different perspectives right. and different right. ways of identifying with their traditions. Right. I mean, uh, in American Judaism, you've always had well, people people were defined as either Reformed, Conservative, or uh, or orthodox, but I think every every religion, every spiritual group that I've encountered uh, has those d divisions right. within. You kind of that right. They kind of mirror those breakdowns of how people approach their religions. Right. But right. even within each of those, there'll be differences. Right. Yeah. And and you know and there's uh, you know we should mention and maybe get somebody on to talk about this in in more uh, depth, but. You know, there's people who have done serious research on that. Uh, Ken Wilbur comes to mind. We we um, talked about him, and he's mm -hmm. the grand synthesizer of all these models of development and their um, mm -hmm. implications. So I would I would encourage people to to look at uh, Ken Wilbur's work. Uh, but even um, and one of the he draws on on the work of scientists who have done studies about this, and one that's um, uh, very well regarded in the field of religion is by uh, a, a scientist or a social scientist named Fowler. I think his first name was James James Fowler, and he wrote a book and based on his research called Stages of Faith. And uh, in there, he he talks about some of the things Kurt was alluding to. He has his own names for these things and his own way of categorizing but it, it it just breaks down all the the everybody the human approach to uh, right, spirituality right. and religion right and and uh, uh we we spoke a little bit about the this current pope in uh, the catholic church and that's very interesting because uh you know according to kurt's definition uh this pope is very uh far along on the uh path of evolution uh, uh, in terms of religion in terms of spirituality where he's seeing uh, unity and and uh, and non-duality, uh, where as uh, much of the church that he uh, watches over uh, or governs uh, uh, is nowhere near him in terms of that type of evolution. But what makes it extra interesting to watch the Catholic Church and what's going on there now is the Pope is considered to be in matters of faith infallible. I mean that's <laughs> yes. that's a belief. So so the folks that are sort of battling him. At the same time, they adhere to this doctrine of the Pope being infallible. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm getting a kick out of watching it because I see a lot of these <laughs> conservative newscasters on American TV who are Catholic really struggling with the Pope talking about global warming and uh, being more reasonable to, to, to gay people. Uh, although, you know, they're not totally opening their arms uh, to, to gays, to women, uh, in terms of changing things in the church. But they, his movement in that direction has these people... Very upset. I think they, they're just hoping this pope fades away fast. But uh, are you? I, do you particularly get a kick out of that because of your own Catholic upbringing? Yeah, how I Catholic, do. I grew up how Catholic. How Catholic was it? Uh, well, my my parents were never uh, very. I didn't go to Catholic school. They weren't very strict about it. They thought it was a good thing. But my parents made it very clear from the beginning that they did not believe one religion was better than another. This just happened to be the the the, the path we're on. 
Uh, and so, uh, but I did get the catechism, and I did was exposed to priests and nuns, and, and some of them were great, and some of them were horrible, and uh, the, everything in between. But uh, the fanaticism, like we, this is the way, our way or the highway. And you reach a certain point in your life, I did, where you just realize that's, to me, uh, it was silly. And uh, so seeing the Pope uh, push a lot of buttons in regard to that and many other areas, I, I'm really enjoying. <laughs> well, we hope he's successful. I'm sure that his opponents in the church can explain in uh, kind of convoluted theological uh, terms why it's okay to disagree with uh, a pope because infallibility applies to certain things and not others. No, no, it's great. I mean, how do you argue with an infallible person? Try telling your well, wife because he's only infallible. infallible when it comes to certain things. Matters of, the, okay, matters of faith. But uh, that's, that's a pretty big umbrella. So, yeah, it's um, fairly crazy within the church right now. And, uh, I'll bet. and like you said, some, some churches, some, uh, some uh, areas of uh, Catholicism, some geographic areas are very supportive, supportive and some are just thinking this is a, a, a bad pope and he'll pass eventually. So, But I think the pope, what the pope has to probably deal with um, as a, the head of his flock which has people at all levels of development and different uh, perspectives and points of view um, is probably similar to what a lot of us go through when, you know, we go home for the holidays right. <laughs> or have Thanksgiving dinner right. or have conversations with our coworkers. We might have what we think of as a, as a more developed uh, awareness of uh, pluralism and so forth. And then you, encounter people and how do you relate to that how do you attempt to bring people up to a different level of perspective without insulting them or or causing uh, the opposite kind of reaction and you know it's not easy it's called family holiday arguments and uh <laughs> but we should have somebody from uh, the catholic church on i i, I give you another example i spoke to a friend of mine who's a trappist monk i speak to him on the phone periodically and he said even within the church like he's a guy that uh, is was involved very early on with centering prayer and all, and right? There are other elements of the church that think that it doesn't belong in the church, so they battle each other. And uh, sure, it's it's uh, fun stories. Sure, I'm sure within his monastery there are people you know who disagree with each other and are antagonists when it comes to ideas and and philosophies. I always say, you know, it's not just that. If you look at any religion, like just take Christianity, the dominant religion in the West, there's huge diversity within Christianity. And I, I don't just mean Methodists are different from Presbyterians and both of them are different from Catholics, but it's like you go to any church and you'll find people, you know, sitting next to each other in the pews and they'll be very different in their approach to their religion. Right. And so it goes. Uh, so it goes. <laughs> so a, another... Um... Fun, in, fun and uh, informative interview. Yes, sir. Always good to have those three-way conversations with you. All right. Next time. Next time. Take Spirit care. Spirit Matters, spiritmatterstalk.com. Thank you for listening.